Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to another uh, elder-led service at the Lutheran Church of the Savior. Um, uh, this is the kind of the end of the summer, my wife said this morning. A lot of school t children are going to be going back to school soon, or maybe some already have. So we're glad that you're able to spend your, well, the waning days of summer, at least one morning with us, to help celebrate the life and the days that, that God has given us. He's given us so much in our lives, and today is another one of those days. Uh, I understand we have a couple of announcements to give this morning, and then we can proceed with the service. Are there any other announcements? Well, with those out of the way, let's begin. This is the, the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We begin with the opening song. Oh 
joyful sound of our offering. As your saints bow down, as your people sing, we will rise with you lifted on your wings, and the world will see that. Yes, the world. Because we know our God saves, we are free to come before him in confession. Holy Lord, we stand in your presence. We are aware of our sins of thought, word, and action. We have not always our hearts according to your will. We have often failed to live up to your expectations. We have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But we know your promise that if we confess our sins, O oh Lord, hear us now as we confess our sins to you. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your temporary punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, merciful Father, in holy baptism you declared us to be your children and gathered us into your one holy church in which you daily and richly forgive us our sins and grant us new life through your spirit. Be in our midst, enliven our faith, and graciously receive our prayer and praise through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. We continue with a song of praise. Come to me now, the 
with the uh, psalm appointed for today, Psalm 138, read responsively, whole verse on whole verse. I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I sing your praise. I bow down before your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you are above all your name. On the day I called, you answered me. My strength of soul you increased. And they shall sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand delivers me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, whom to know is everlasting life, grant us to know your Son, Jesus, to be the way, the truth, and the life, that we may boldly confess him to be the Christ and steadfastly walk in the way that leads to life eternal. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We continue with the readings. Please be seated. The Old Testament reading appointed for today is from Isaiah chapter 51, starting at the first verse. Listen to me, you who pursue righteousness, you who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn and to the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham your father and to Sarah who bore you, for he was but one when I called him, that I might bless him and multiply him. For the Lord comforts Zion, he comforts all her waste places and makes her wilderness like Eden, her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving and the voice of song. Give attention to me, my people, and give ear to me, my nation. 
for law will go out from me, and I will set my justice for a light to the peoples. My righteousness draws near, my salvation has gone out, and my arms will judge the peoples. The coastlands hope for me, and for my arm they wait. Lift up your eyes to the heavens, and look at the earth beneath, for the heavens vanish like smoke. The earth will wear out like a garment, and they who dwell in it will die in like manner. But my salvation will be forever, and my righteousness will never be dismayed. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle lesson, which forms uh, one of the texts for today's sermon, is from Romans chapter 11, verses 33 to 12, verse 8. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are his judgments, and how inscrutable his ways! For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor, or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him, and through him, and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, in proportion to our faith. If service, in our serving. The one who teaches, in his teaching. The one who exhorts, in his exhortation. The one who contributes, in generosity. The one who leads, with zeal. The one who does acts of mercy, with cheerfulness. This is the word of the Lord. Be to God. Uh, please rise for the reading of the gospel. And this is drawn from St. Matthew, the 16th chapter. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. Now please join me as we confess the faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to George the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Um, 
we continue with the sermon song, you may be seated. like to ask the young members of the congregation to come to the front for the uh, children's message, led by Lori.
Thank you, Lori. Grace, mercy, and peace be with you from God our Father, through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. There's a story called The Three Questions that if you'll indulge me, I'd like to share with you. The story is about a young king who just came to the throne, his father having passed away. And this king had a good spirit. He wanted to do a good job. He wanted to have a successful reign. But he was a little concerned that he didn't know what sorts of projects, what sort of undertakings he should have, and when he should do these projects or these, these tasks, and with whom he should do them. So he called all the advisors together, the court advisors and the philosophers and the professors and the astrologers and all the people who advised him and asked them, what should I do as king? When should I do this? And with whom should I do this? Well, they all had things to offer him, of course. They concentrated mostly on the when part. The, um, the, the scribes and the people who managed the, the, the palace said, well, you have to make a, a weekly schedule to plan your daily activities for every day of the week. And the philosophers and the uh, educators said, well, we have to plan an annual schedule so that you'll know what is the right thing to do in what season. And the long-term strategists thought, no, 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 we have to come up with a decade-long, multi-decade schedule to come up with all these things that the kingdom must accomplish. And then he asked, well, what should I do? Well, every category of advisor had a different thing that he should do. The philosophers thought he should be studying, you know, deep science and deep, deep thinking, and the, and the scribes and so forth thought he should just fix up the, the castle, you know, all sorts of things, everything in the domain of each of the, of the advisors. 
And with whom should I do these things? Well, of course, you should do these things with me, he said to everybody, or with those, those like me. Give us more money so that we can accomplish these great goals for our kingdom. His advice was so multitudinous and so varied that it didn't really help. He still didn't know what he should do and when he should do it and with whom he should do it. So like every good young man, he turned to his mother, the dowager queen, and said, all my advisors are telling me different things. I don't know what I should do. And she said, well, I can't really help you, son. I don't really know what you should do either. But you know, your father, the departed king, had once upon a time a very trusted advisor who he said never failed him. You should seek him out. And the young king said, oh, that's right. He did have somebody like that. What was his name again? Benjamin. Oh, well, where's Benjamin? I don't know, but I've been told that he lives in the woods all by himself as a hermit. Now, you know, a lot of these stories involve hermits, right? So, so the king said, I will set out. He took his bodyguard with him to set across the kingdom to the woods. And nearing the hermit's place of residence, he, he told his bodyguard, now stay here while I go talk to the hermit. So he got to the hermit. The hermit was outside his little hut with a shovel in hand. He was digging up the soil. The hermit was rather old at the point, this point. And the king could tell that with every shovel full of earth that he turned, there was a great exertion for him. And he was breathing hard. So the king went up to him and said, Dear Benjamin, you advised my father so well. I have three questions I would like to have answers. What should I do as the king of this kingdom? And when should I do it? And with whom should I do it? Well, the hermit just kept digging the soil. And the king, seeing how he was exerting himself and he was out of breath, said, here, give me that shovel, let me help you. So the king started digging the soil instead while the hermit sat down in the shade. And the king worked and worked and worked until the whole field was dug up. It took him hours to do this. And finally, he set the spade aside and said to the hermit, Will you answer my questions now? I've dug up your whole field for you. And the hermit just looked at him. And all of a sudden, a man appeared from the woods, running towards them, clutching his side. Oh, help me, help me, said the man. And he fell down. And the king rushed over to him and saw the man had a wound in his side. He was bleeding profusely. So the king tore off his shirt and pushed it on the wound and stopped the bleeding. And little by little, the bleeding did stop. And the man was, well, he was still injured, obviously, but he was going to live. So the king picked him up and took him to the hermit's cabin and set him down in the hermit's little cot and gave him something to drink and let him regain his strength and stayed with him that night until the next morning when they both woke up, the man and the king, and the king said, who are you and why did you appear here with a wound, such, so, such a grievous wound? And the man said to the king, I know who you are, but you don't know me. You're the king and I am the brother of the man you recently executed the man that you took the property away from, the man whom I swore I would revenge. And I had come to this, this woods to kill you. I knew you were coming to visit the hermit, so I lay in wait in the woods. And I saw you as you left the bodyguard, but I lay in wait for you to return to kill you as you came, went back to the castle. But you didn't come back. You took a long time. I became impatient, so I came out of my hiding place to come after you. But your bodyguard found me, and they attacked me, and they stabbed me, and I was just barely able to escape them. And that's why I'm here today. 
and you saved my life. And because he saved my life, I will forgive you because I know you didn't have to save me. I'll forgive you of the, what I thought you did to my brother and I will be your, your vassal the rest of my days if you'll forgive me. And the king, rather happy to have won such an easy friend out of an erstwhile enemy, forgave him, and the two were restored. Well, of course, now the king went out to the uh, hermit. The whole reason he was there to, was to get answers to his questions. He went to the hermit and said, will you now please, after all this time, after all this has happened, will you now answer my questions finally? And the hermit finally spoke and said, your questions have already been answered twice over. The king said, what? You haven't said anything. The hermit said, well, you want to know what you should do, when you should do it, and with whom should you do it? What should you do? Well, you helped me with digging up my, my soil. If you hadn't done that, if we would have just had a brief conversation, you would have returned along the path back to the castle, and that man would have attacked you and probably killed you. With whom should you do this? Or what you should you do? You, you help me with the soil. When should you do it? Well, you did it right when the task was there in front of you. With whom should you do it? You did it with me, help me be advising you. And then when the man appeared out of the woods with a wound, what did you do? You helped him right then and there with the man who's right with you at that moment in time. If you hadn't helped him, he would have remained, he would have either died or if he had recovered anyway, he would have remained your enemy for life. And so the answers to your questions are, you should do the tasks that God puts in front of you when he puts them in front of you with those people around you. Sometimes those people are the ones who are most in need. So that's an old story. But the question is, how does that relate to the lessons we read today in church? How does it connect with the gospel of the epistle? In the gospel, which was the basis of the children's sermon, we have a famous profession of faith by Simon Peter. It's a pivotal point of his life. It's when he gets his new name, Peter, the rock. And the, the, the lesson says, Jesus asks his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now this is a remarkable profession of faith. It's powerful, it's direct, forthright. But how did Peter come up with it? Jesus tells us how. He tells us it will be accomplished through it. He said that Peter said this because, well, I'll read. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are the Peter. You are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. So this profession of faith came to Peter from God, not by his own perception, but as a gift from on high. And just as in the story of the king and the hermit, the tasks, the time, and the people are all a gift from God. And it's a good thing, too, that these are gifts from God because we know that Simon Peter was not a perfect man. He was flawed, just as we are flawed people. And, you know, the promise that Christ will build his church on this rock of Peter is often misinterpreted to mean he was going to build it on Peter himself. But that's not the case. It means that he's going to build the church on the faith that Peter is professing. This faith is a much stronger rock than Peter is because it is a gift from God, not a construct of man. And we 
Christians, we men and women of Christ, we do contribute ourselves to building this church to this day. We work to accomplish what Christ has promised, to build his church on this earth. We do the tasks that God has put in front of us. Now, what tasks do we do? What roles do we fill? Oh, let me count the ways. Well, we have pastors. We pray we will have a pastor in this church again soon. Deaconesses, we have teachers. We have musicians and singers. We have worship servants. We have council and committee members. Think of those people who come into church to prepare the coffee and the goodies every Sunday. Think of those who print the bulletins, who call on the sick or the bereaved, who uh, maintain the church building, who prepare the sanctuary for worship. Now, this list could go on, and I, I hope I don't insult anybody by leaving them off, but you get the point. There are roles for everybody. Now, when should we do these tasks that God has put before us? Well, now is the best time when the tasks are presented to us. God will let us see what needs to be done. And with whom should we do these tasks? Well, I mentioned lots of roles already. Look around you in the pews. These are the people God has given us to help us do these things. Now, how does this actually work? Before the church service started, I passed out a few envelopes to some people in the congregation. And we can use those now. Let's say I want to build a house. And I've already selected a good place for this house, a nice, strong foundation. It's already poured. And, you know... Knowing the parables of Jesus, I'm told I should not build on sand, right? So I'm building on a strong foundation on a rock. But I don't know exactly how this house should be constructed or designed. I don't know what to do. Is there anybody who, here who can help me with that? Is there somebody out there with envelope number one? Ah, could you bring that for us? Let's see what we should do. I've been looking forward to this all day. Ah, envelope number one. Stay right here, would you please? Let's see what we have here. Ah, we have a piece of paper. Look at that. He brought a blueprint. That's very good. Now I know how to build a house. Look, there's the front of the house. There's a floor, first floor, second floor we're going to get. That's great. Thank you. Now stay right here. Okay, so now we know what to build, right? And so I can, with these plans, I can call the, the lumber uh, shop and have the, all the uh, materials delivered, but now I need to actually put it together. That's a lot of work for me. I need some help. Does anybody out there have envelope number two? Envelope number two. Ah, here we go. Could you bring that up? We've got the plans. Let's see what we have in envelope number two. Well, looky there. It's a hammer. Did you, this is great. You can help me with, with, with uh, pounding nails today. We can, we can, we can uh, assemble this house according to these plans that we have. That's wonderful. Thank you for that. Oh, now, now we have a lot of work to do. Let's, let's, oh, it's a hot day. Oh, it's a long day. We've, we've been pounding nails all day long. We're kind of tired. We don't know if we're going to be able to finish this job. We need more help. Is there anybody out there with envelope number three? Envelope, why? We have envelope three. Oh, this is great. We have somebody else to help. Let's see what's in envelope number three. I've been looking forward to this one too. Why? It's a glass of lemonade. Oh, this will be refreshing. Thank you so much. This is wonderful. So now we have the plans. We've put the house together. We've been refreshed. And we can call it a success. Now, I have a question for you all. Did any of you know what was in these envelopes before we opened them up today? No. You didn't know. And that's how it is. With, you may return to your seats now. Thank you so much for helping us. That's how it often is 
we have skills or abilities that we sometimes don't even know what they are, that God has given us, and we don't find out until the opportunity arises, and we say, oh, I can try that. Oh, I can do that, or I can pitch it a little here. And it turns out, to God's greater glory, that it works. And that's how, that's how God prepares things for us to do. So, now clearly there could have been many more pictures I could have added to this. I didn't put in the nails and the, and the plumbing and the electrical work and all this other stuff. And there's some of you who know a lot more about this than I do. But you get the point. Each person could help in some way, sometimes with a skill or resource they didn't even know that they had. Sometimes the tasks are more intellectual, like the, the blueprints. Sometimes they're more physical, like bringing a hammer to help pound some nails. Sometimes more nurturing and caring, like providing some refreshments. Whatever task God puts before us, someone has the ability to pitch in. And that takes us to the second lesson for today from the epistle. From this we learn, for as in one body we have many members, and that the members not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ, individually members of one another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them, if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the ones who do acts of mercy with cheerfulness. You see, God accomplishes a lot through us. He doesn't require us to be all-knowing or all-powerful. We aren't. But he is. His love is all-encompassing. And the salvation he's already accomplished for us through the death and resurrection of his son, is already complete. And he wants his dear children to use his gifts according to the grace he has given us, every one of us. So what should we do? The tasks God puts before us. If you don't see something, just ask. And when should we do these things? How about now, when the tasks or when the needs are before us? And with whom should we do these things? With those around us. But always, always with Jesus. Remember, Jesus said in today's lesson, on this rock, I will build my church. It is Jesus building the church. We are just his uh, helpers. And we have a hymn in our hymnal that we're not singing today called, Let Us Ever Walk With Jesus. And so we should, because if we walk with Jesus, we will not walk astray. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. So we continue with the prayers. Please rise. Mm, there we go. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Almighty God, from you and through you and to you are all things. You have built your church on the confession of the gospel and have promised that the gates of hell will not overcome it. To your church throughout the world, grant the faith and courage to confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God Almighty, you transform your church by the Holy Spirit so that she does not conform to the world. Draw forth from your people their proclamation of thanksgiving that they may tell of all your wondrous deeds. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, grant that the office of the keys may be honored among us, in order that we may confess our sin 
and be involved in the name of Christ. As you have so graciously forgiven us, grant that we may extend this grace by forgiving others. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, care for all families, children, single adults and youth, that they might steadfastly walk in the way that leads to life eternal. Grant an increase in wisdom and grace to all who teach and learn. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, grant that all nations and leaders might act for peace, promote godliness, and protect all who live under violence, oppression, injustice, and fear, that all people might extol you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, care for all victims of disaster, for those stricken by illness or infirmity, for the aged and infirm, for the grieving and those near death. Especially show your steadfast love to Sonny, Carol, Barbara, Bob, Frank, Bill, Dan, Aneta, Carol, Laureen, Sarah, Beth, the Draymond family, Emily, Jimmy, Kevin, Diana, Matt, and those others we name in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. From you and through you and to you are all things. To you, O Father, with the Son and the Holy Spirit, be glory now and forever. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now, may the Lord bless us and keep us. The Lord make his face shine on us and be gracious unto us. And the Lord look upon us with favor and give us peace. Amen. We close with a closing song. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord Jesus who reigns forever. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon.